Hello everyone, I'm Sister Vasa, and I'm... All right, I'm not supposed to wave. I don't know why I waved. Okay, just, let's, let's do it again. Okay, we're not gonna use that one. Okay, going again. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Sister Vasa, and I'm having my coffee right now here in Vienna in Austria. Today we will talk about one of the most influential and beloved saints of all Christendom, Saint Basil the Great. I know it's exciting. In the Byzantine liturgical tradition, Saint Basil is remembered really on a daily basis because several well-known daily prayers are attributed to him and ten times a year we celebrate his Eucharistic Liturgy, the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil the Great. St. Basil's feast day is celebrated on January 1st, which is the day of his repose. The reason we're discussing him today is we must now make up for the many episodes we missed this past year while I was traveling. And in case you didn't notice, we did miss the entire month of January. You see, we are planning to make a full year of DVDs so that these videos can more easily be used at home or in the classroom, for example in parish schools. In fact, we keep hassling you to get one of these mugs. We're selling them because we're trying to raise funds to make these DVDs, and we don't have nearly enough to do that. So get a mug if you don't have one yet, and let's talk about St. Basil the Great. Basil the Great was born into a very saintly and wealthy family in Caesarea in Cappadocia in Asia Minor in around the year 330. By the way, we did talk about this family already in our episode on Saint Macrina, who was Basil's elder sister. Basil was the second eldest child of Basil the Elder and Emilia, who are both canonized saints, as are several of their children, including Saint Gregory of Nyssa and Saint Peter of Sebaste, Basil's younger brothers. Basil was born at a time of great transitions and controversies, both within the Church and the Roman Empire. About 17 years before Saint Basil's birth, Emperor Constantine the Great granted official toleration to Christians within the empire in an agreement he made with his rival, Emperor Licinius, in the year 313, an agreement known as the Edict of Milan. Constantine himself embraced the Christian faith and became interested in church matters, including theological questions, which had thus far been sort of brewing under the surface or in the underground of a persecuted church. Just five years before Basil's birth, in the year 325, Constantine summoned the first ecumenical council in the city of Nicaea, not far from the new capital of the Roman Empire, Constantinople. This council officially condemned the teaching of Arius, called Arianism, which rejected the divinity of Christ, saying, he was created by God the Father, and hence not co-eternal and consubstantial with the Father. Although the Council did reject this teaching and proclaimed that Christ is indeed consubstantial with the Father, it actually marked only the beginning of the battle with Arianism, because as it turned out, most bishops of the East actually believed in some form of Arianism, even though they signed the d decree of the Council. The Emperor himself also ended up siding with Arianism somewhat after the Council, as did several emperors after him. But let's get back to St. Basil. He received the best education available at the time, and not only in the Christian faith. He studied first in Caesarea and then in Constantinople and Athens, along with another student, Gregory of Nazians, who became his close friend. Basil very industriously studied the subjects of rhetoric, 
the art of effective speaking or writing, grammar, philosophy, astronomy, geometry, and medicine. He was later to put these subjects to good use in his theological works. When he returned home after his studies, as Gregory of Nyssa describes, he was all puffed up about his academic achievements and began to pursue an illustrious career in law and teaching rhetoric. But largely under the influence of his sister Macrina, he soon decided to abandon his career and devote his life entirely to God and become a monk. He was baptized at this point in the year 356 at the age of 26 in Caesarea. Because you see, it was not yet customer, customary to baptize infants. He then traveled to various monastic centers in the East and observed various forms of monasticism and found himself drawn to the communal monastic life. So he settled on his family's isolated estate near Annesi, together with a group of like-minded monastics. Although St. Basil only spent five years within this monastic community, it was here that he wrote his very important instructions on monastic communal life, which were to influence the development of monastic traditions, not only in the East, but also in the West. In the year 364, <clears throat> Basil was summoned by the local bishop to Caesarea, where Basil was ordained priest and assisted the bishop in managing the diocese, combating various forms of the Arian heresy, and working hard to attain church unity in a very complicated church political climate. When the local bishop died, <clears throat> St. Basil was chosen to succeed him and was consecrated bishop of Caesarea in the year 370 at the age of 40. As Bishop St. Basil is described by his contemporaries as sometimes hot-blooded and imperious, but also generous and very sympathetic. He built a complex outside Caesarea, for example, which included a poorhouse, a hospice, and a hospital. And we know from his letters, we have many of his letters, that he personally worked to reform prostitutes and thieves. He was also a very ardent and popular preacher, preaching every morning and evening in his own church. He also continued as bishops his efforts to achieve church unity, as well as his theological writing, which immensely contributed to defining the church's teaching on the Holy Trinity with precision. St. Basil died in 379 at the age of 49. Today, I'd like to reflect on what I find is St. Basil's most striking quality. Wait for it. His inconsistency. While being very theologically precise and uncompromising concerning truth and faith, he often demonstrated a remarkable inconsistency in the area of liturgical and canonical practice for the sake of church unity. That is, he didn't insist on his own opinions and practices if they could be surrendered without a sacrifice of truth. For example, perhaps surprisingly for some of us, he did not insist that certain heretics be rebaptized when they were accepted into the church after he learned that other bishops did not rebaptize those same heretics. You could read that in the first canon of St. Basil. Even though Basil himself, as he writes, disagreed with that policy, and that was not his policy. He did not disrupt church unity with those bishops and accepted their policy. So one could say that Basil the Great was inconsistent. And that is a healthy quality, if you think about it, because actually perfect consistency or being perfectly logical is not a characteristic of a sane person, but rather that of a madman, as G.K. Chesterton writes. The madman is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. 
You know, we sometimes like to think that church history is very simple, with very clear black and white rules being followed by the great fathers of the church. But if that's the way we see church history, then then we we don't know much about history. Yes, thank you. Don't know much biology. He did not follow church rules as he understood them to the letter. Basil the Great rather performed his ministry, his priesthood, in the spirit. Because St. Basil's competence as a church leader ultimately came not from any rules or external forms, but from God, from the Holy Spirit. This is the ministry of the Spirit, of which St. Paul writes, Our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a New Testament, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Of course, rules have their place and their reason, and the Apostle is not calling us to anarchy. However, let's remember that in our lives, in the Church of the Holy Spirit, it is He who guides the implementation of the rules, and not the other way around. That's it for today. St. Basil the Great, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.